Hi folks, this is Karim Rao from Riot Visualizer channel. We will continue our lab, the Matrix Labs, the video number 40. We have been discussing in the previous video the following. We have been still working with the testimony report findings concerning the Active Directory. We have finished all of the findings uh, of the testimony report concerning uh, the domain. Okay, and then we will go to the next section, which is the findings concerning the domain controllers in a certain domain. So we can see this is the domain controller. We have two uh, domain controllers, the primary domain controller and the additional domain controller. We will see the successful findings of the testimony report and the failure findings in the testimony report and how we can fix the failure test and uh, changed it to successful tests. So the first thing here of uh, the testimony report concerning uh, the findings in the domain controllers, first he is trying to gather information about the domain controller. First, uh, he need to see the IP addresses of the domain controller. If the I registered correctly in the uh, in the DNS, and he need to make sure that the a computer object of the domain controller uh, is enabled in the Active Directory. So we all know that there is computer objects in the Active Directory representing the PC or the server. So these computer objects should be enabled. If one of these objects are disabled, then we cannot able to access this server or this PC and we are not able to communicate with it. I think so. And then the last thing to test the domain control is it is a global catalog or not. We need to know that we need to have only at least one domain controller holding the global catalog feature. A global catalog is a feature very, very simple. The domain controller have a snapshot of all of the active directory object within the forest. So if you need to query uh, a domain controller that has full knowledge about what is in the forest you need to query a domain controller that's, that have the global catalog feature installed on it so and this should be one within the whole forest okay so he is testing all of the information concerning the domain controller we will see that uh, the the data gathered by this report is very very detailed so here is the uh, the domain controller uh, name and the OU holding this domain controller and then we can see this is the default partition here he is referring to the domain partition and this is the domain and this the computer object is enabled this is the forest this is the host name okay recorded in the DNS the host name okay of the primary domain controller then a couple of uh, uh, data or a couple of uh, data values I don't think what is uh, invocation ID I don't know actually and this is the IP address of the, the primary domain controller and if it has IP version 6 it will be also listed here it is a global catalog it is true that means it is a global catalog if it is false then it is not a global catalog it's not a read only domain controller is read only this is means false it's not a read only domain controller and this is the LDA port so it will test if it can communicate with the Active Directory database using the normal LDAP protocol, we have already the normal LDAP protocol and the LDAP S protocol. Okay, you can communicate with both protocols uh, with the Active Directory database. This is the name again, and this is some an NTDS setting. We all know that the NTDS setting is very very important because it's it saves the replication information okay for the primary domain controller okay who is his partner when to replicate the replication replication interval a lot of things okay all of this is in the ntds setting and then we can see also some data concerning the operating system installed on this server and we can go further to see this is the service pack and then we can see the uh, vismo roles that all of these roles are are held by the primary domain controller so we can see a lot of detailed information concerning our primary domain control and this is the partitions of the active directory database okay and if you go further with the data we can see this is very very detailed data the site that this primary domain controller is a member of and then the ssl port this is 
the LDAP S protocol and the port it will communicate with uh, the Active Directory database if you, it's in, if it is using LDAP S protocol. So as you can see, these are all very very useful information. Actually, it can be used as an inventory for your primary domain controller it contains a lot of useful information so the first thing we need to test is our primary domain controller all of this data should be available if one of these data is not available for example is the computer object is not enabled then we are in a problem just a moment guys so let's continue guys here what will happen if as we have said before that the uh, domain controller active directory computer object is not enabled and if all of the domain controllers uh, in the forest doesn't have the global catalog feature uh, enabled on it or at least one of the domain controllers in the forest should have a global catalog feature uh, installed on it let's ask the AI tools to see what will be the consequences of something like that and this uh, to uh, we will do that so that we could know how this test is very very important because if one of these three are not available or we cannot uh, get or we didn't succeed in getting any of this information uh, concerning the domain controller or if this test uh, failed uh, in total how this will affect our active directory or how this will uh, affect uh, the network in general okay or the domain in general let's see that So let's see the answer of Claude and then we will ask ChatGPT for O and ask uh, Perplexity. Let's see that one. Okay, so we can see here, this is the answer of uh, Claude. Let's read it loudly. Would you like me to elaborate on any specific aspects of these scenarios? Let me address both parts of your question. If one of your domain controller's Active Directory computer objects is disabled, this can have serious consequences for your Active Directory environment. The disabled domain controller will stop authenticating users and processing logon requests. It will no longer replicate Active Directory data with other domain controllers. Services relying on that specific domain controller may fail. DNS and DHCP services hosted on that domain controller, if any, will become unavailable. Group policy processing may be affected for clients that were using this domain controller. However, if you have other functioning domain controllers, they will continue to provide services to your network. Clients will fail over to the remaining active domain controllers. If all domain controllers in the forest don't have the global catalog feature installed, this scenario would cause significant issues across your entire active directory forest. Universal group membership information won't be available 
affecting access to resources. Domain-wide searches will be severely limited, impacting many applications and services. Exchange Server, if used, will not function properly, as it relies heavily on the global catalog. User logons in multi-domain environments will fail or be extremely slow. Applications that query the global catalog for forest-wide information will not work correctly. In a nutshell, not having any global catalog servers in your forest would severely cripple your Active Directory functionality, especially in multi-domain environments. It's a critical component for efficient Active Directory operations. To maintain a healthy Active Directory environment, it's recommended to keep all domain controller computer objects enabled unless there's a specific reason to disable them. Ensure that at least some of your domain controllers, ideally more than one for redundancy, have the global catalog role installed. Would you like me to elaborate on any specific aspects of these scenarios? Copy. Retry. So Claude can make mistakes. So let's wait for a moment, guys. So let's continue, guys. Here we can see this is the consequences of uh, not having uh, the domain controller uh, computer object in the Active Directory enabled. And if you don't have a global catalog uh, feature installed on one of your domain controllers in the follow stick, okay, you will see that we have seen that universal group membership, for example, information will what would be available affecting to access to resources. Domain-wide searches will severely limit impacting many applications and services. Exchange will not function properly. It relies heavily on the global catalog. User login in multi-domain environments will fail or be extremely slow. Applications that query the global catalog for forest-wide information will not work. Uh, anyway, even though it's uh, it is a uh, generic answer, but we can see how this is very very important, or this test is very very important to make sure that you have this feature enabled and you have your domain controller computer object in the Active Directory enabled. So let's see also the answer of uh, ChatGPT for all concerning this question Okay, one question here. Uh, the global, we will discuss the answer now, the global catalog feature. Uh, uh, in the forest. No, if it should be hosted on which domain controller that's uh, because i need to know if it should be only one global catalog feature installed in the forest or in each domain So he is saying that uh, you should have okay, multi-domain control. It's best practice to have the global catalog role on more than one domain control for redundancy and load balancing in a single environment. Enable catalog on all of the domain controllers in multi-site environment. Have at least one global catalog server in each site. So if you have sites, you should have. So this means that in each uh, I think in each domain you should have uh, one domain controller having the global catalog feature installed. Domain controllers in the forest root domain. This should be pretty typical, be global catalog, catalog server. They have complete view of the forest infrastructure. Uh, so here the question is something. Uh, we need to know, one, 
per forest or one per domain. So let's see what will be the answer. Mm, so okay, so he's saying that uh, the global should be configured more extensively than just one per forest or one per domain. Here is a clear explanation. Per forest, you need more than one global catalog server per forest. So it's not one per forest. Having only one for the entire forest would create a single point of failure. Okay. So this is one thing. Per domain, it's recommended to have at least one global catalog server in each domain and to have another one for redundancy. This is good also. So, however, for most environments, you won't have more than one per domain for redundancy. So, so I was mistaken. You need to have at least a per domain to have two domain controllers hosting the global catalog okay, feature. So not per forest. You need to have per domain, we can be very specific, per domain you should have two domain controllers hosting the global catalog feature. Okay, so this is what I was seeking here. Okay, let's see the answer of ChatGPT concerning what will happen if uh, we have our domain controller uh, Active Directory computer object disabled and the global catalog feature is not present. Disabling a domain controller's Active Directory computer object and not having any domain controllers in the forest with the global catalog feature can significantly impact the functionality of your Active Directory environment. Here's a detailed explanation of each scenario. Hash, disabling a domain controller's Active Directory computer object. When you disable the Active Directory computer object of a domain controller, several consequences arise. One, replication issues. The disabled domain controller will not participate in Active Directory replication. This can lead to inconsistencies in the directory data across different domain controllers. 2. Authentication and authorization. Clients and servers that attempt to authenticate or obtain authorization data from the disabled domain controller will fail. This could lead to login issues and access problems for users and applications. 3. FSMO roles. If the disabled domain controller holds any flexible single master operations, FSMO roles, those roles will not be able to perform their specific functions. This could impact tasks such as schema updates, domain naming, RID allocation, PDC emulator functions, and infrastructure master operations. 4. DNS services. If the domain controller also functions as a DNS server, disabling it will cause DNS resolution issues, affecting name resolution within the domain. 5. Group policy updates that rely on the disabled domain controller will not be processed. This can affect policy application across the domain. No domain controllers with global catalog feature. The global catalog, GC, holds a partial replica of every object in the forest, making it essential for certain operations. 1. Universal group membership. Without a GC, users will not be able to log in because the universal group memberships cannot be resolved. This will lead to authentication failures, especially in a multi-domain forest. 2. Forest-wide searches. The global catalog facilitates searches across the entire forest. Without it, such searches will fail, affecting applications and services that rely on these searches. 3. Exchange Server. If you use Microsoft Exchange, it relies heavily on the GC to resolve email addresses and perform global address list lookups. Without a GC, Exchange functionality will be significantly impaired. 4. Replication and trust relationships. Certain replication tasks and trust relationship verifications require a GC. These processes will be disrupted, potentially leading to a breakdown in forest-wide operations and trust validations. Best practices. Ensure at least one global catalog server is present in each domain to maintain forest-wide operations and efficient searches. Avoid disabling domain controller computer objects unless you are decommissioning or replacing the domain controller. Properly demote the domain controller if it is no longer needed. Regularly monitor the health and replication status of your domain controllers using tools like DC Diag and Repadmin.
Ensure that FSMO roles are distributed across multiple domain controllers to prevent single points of failure. Conclusion Disabling a domain controller's computer object can lead to significant operational issues within your domain, while lacking a global catalog server in the forest can severely disrupt authentication and directory searches. Proper management and monitoring of your domain controllers and their roles are crucial for maintaining a healthy active directory environment. So this is why this test is very, very important. You need to make sure all of these uh, 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 items in the test is succeeded okay and domain control information he will check the dns records uh, for the domain controller dns record contains the name and uh, the host name and the ip address so this means that dns records for the domain controller is correct so this will lead to successful uh, communication with the domain controller and successful communication with the active directory so all of these are very very important uh, items to look for and to test okay and then the second thing is to test for the windows remote management this is a service that will enable you to remotely uh, apply uh, uh, powershell commands and command prompt commands remotely on servers this is very very important we need to make sure it is also enabled so we can uh, implement or we can apply remote commands on remote servers so this is a uh, one thing we need to make sure that the Windows Remote Management Service is enabled on the domain controller so we can apply uh, PowerShell commands and command prompt commands remotely on the domain controller. Okay, this is the Windows Remote Management. Okay, also another question we can ask why Windows Remote Management? service should be enabled on the domain controller on the domain controller so let's see the answer again we are trying to guess why this service or this test is important and why this service is important on the domain controller So we can see here that this is the answer of uh, Claude here is saying a lot of things. Let's see how it will act or how this answer or let's see the answer. Just wait for a moment. So let's continue and see the answer. Start new chat. Start. Enabling the Windows Remote Management WinRM service on domain controllers is important for several reasons. Remote management. WinRM allows administrators to manage the domain controller remotely using PowerShell remoting and other management tools. This is crucial for efficient administration, especially in large or distributed environments. PowerShell remoting. Many active directory management tasks are performed using PowerShell complets. WinRM is required for PowerShell remoting, which allows executing these complets on remote domain controllers. Group policy management. Some group policy management tasks require WinRM to be enabled on domain controllers. This includes refreshing group policy settings and retrieving group policy results. Windows Admin Center. If you use Windows Admin Center for managing your servers, it relies on WinRM for communication with managed nodes, including domain controllers. Monitoring and reporting. Many monitoring and reporting tools use WinRM to collect data and perform health checks on domain controllers. Automation Automated scripts and tools often leverage WinRM for performing tasks across multiple domain controllers. Troubleshooting WinRM can be essential for remote troubleshooting, allowing administrators to access and diagnose issues without physical access to the server. Microsoft Best Practices Microsoft recommends enabling WinRM on domain controllers as part of standard configuration. Event forwarding. If you use Windows event forwarding for centralized logging, WinRM is the underlying protocol used for this feature. Patch management. 
Some patch management solutions use WinRM to deploy and manage updates on domain controllers. It's important to note that while enabling WinRM is beneficial and often necessary, it should be done securely. Use proper firewall rules to restrict access to WinRM ports, typically 5985 for HTTP and 5986 for HTTPS. Implement strong authentication methods. Consider using HTTPS for WinRM connections when possible. Regularly audit and monitor WinRM usage for any suspicious activities. By enabling WinRM on domain controllers, you significantly enhance your ability to manage, monitor, and maintain your Active Directory infrastructure efficiently and securely. Would you like more information on how to securely configure WinRM on domain controllers? Very, very good answer. We can see the importance of this service to be enabled on the domain controllers. So we can get the same, or let's ask uh, ChatGPT the same answer or the same question. And as we can see, I have already this feature enabled on my domain controller. So as you can see, the answer maybe of uh, ChatGPT for all is more uh, or is elaborating more how we can enable the WinRM and the benefits of enabling this service on the domain controller. Let's see the answer. Enabling the Windows Remote Management WinRM service on a domain controller offers several benefits, particularly in the context of managing and administering the domain controller remotely. Here are the key reasons why you should enable WinRM on your domain controller. 1. Remote Administration and Management WinRM allows administrators to perform remote management tasks without needing to log on locally to the domain controller. This capability is particularly useful for Remote PowerShell Administrators can use PowerShell remoting to run scripts and commands on the domain controller from a remote location. Configuration Management Tools like Microsoft System Center, Ansible, and Chef use WinRM to configure and manage Windows servers, including domain controllers. Automation and Scripting Enabling WinRM facilitates automation of administrative tasks through scripts. This can significantly reduce the time and effort required to manage domain controllers and other servers in your network. Automated deployment. Scripts can be used to deploy configurations, updates, and patches to domain controllers remotely. Task scheduling. Routine tasks such as backups, system checks, and updates can be automated using scripts executed via WinRM. 3. Centralized Management WinRM supports centralized management of domain controllers and other servers in your infrastructure. Group Policy Management Administrators can manage and apply group policies from a central location. Event Log Monitoring WinRM enables the remote collection and monitoring of event logs, which is essential for auditing and troubleshooting. Hazard 4. Security and Compliance WinRM enhances security and compliance by allowing secure remote management. Encrypted communication. WinRM uses HTTP over SSL, HTTPS, to encrypt communications between the client and the server, ensuring that sensitive data is protected. Access control. Administrators can configure access controls to specify which users and groups are allowed to perform remote management tasks. Part 5. Interoperability with management tools. Many enterprise management tools rely on WinRM for communication with Windows servers. Enabling WinRM ensures compatibility and interoperability with these tools. Microsoft Operations Manager, MMUM, System Center Configuration Manager, SCCM, Third-Party Monitoring and Management Solutions. Troubleshooting and Support. WinRM provides a robust framework for troubleshooting and support. Remote Diagnostics. Administrators can run diagnostic tools and utilities remotely to troubleshoot issues on the domain controller. Incident response. In the event of an incident, support teams can quickly access the domain controller to investigate and resolve problems. 
How to enable WinRM. To enable WinRM on a domain controller, you can use the following steps. 1. Open a command prompt or PowerShell as administrator. Shell WinRM Quick Config. This command configures WinRM with default settings and starts the service. 2. Enable WinRM through Group Policy. Open the Group Policy Management Console, GPMC. Create or edit a Group Policy Object, GPO, that applies to your domain controllers. Navigate to To Computer Configuration, Policies, Administrative Templates, Windows Components, Windows Remote Management, WinRM, WinRM Service. Enable the Allow Remote Server Management through WinRM Policy. 3. Configure the WinRM Listener. You may need to configure the WinRM Listener to accept connections over HTTP or HTTPS. PowerShell WinRM, create WinRM slash config listener address transport at HTTP. By enabling WinRM, you ensure that your domain controllers can be effectively managed, monitored, and maintained, contributing to a more secure and efficiently managed Active Directory environment. So this is why we need to have this service enabled on the domain controller, and it is already enabled. If we go to the third test, here he wants to make sure concerning the event logs, he wants to make sure that uh, the application logs, the system logs, the security logs, and the Microsoft Windows PowerShell logs, all of these logs are auto backed up. Okay, what is auto backed up? Here, uh, this doesn't mean or this uh, doesn't imply that you are making uh, or you are backing it up through a third-party uh, utility or a third-party soft software or through the Windows Server Backup. Here he is referring to an option I will show you now. This option should be enabled on all of the three types of logs. And another thing he wants to make sure that the log itself is not full or it didn't reach the maximum size. I will show you all what he mean or what he this test do exactly. You need first to go and open the event viewer here you go this is the control panel then we go to administrative tools we'll go to the event viewer then if we open the logs the application log here the first thing the test will see he will check that He will check that you didn't reach the maximum log size. This is the first thing the test will do. If you go there, he will check if the application log is not full. He wants to make sure that you didn't reach the maximum size of the log. And the second thing is to make sure that the log mode is set to auto backup. What is auto backup here? He is referring that you should have this option used. Archive the log when full. So he will archive the log when it reaches its maximum size and open a new file to begin writing in it. This is archive the log when full, okay? So this is the option you need to, uh, he will check if you have all of your uh, logs having this option enabled. I do not prefer to do that because the logs will be archived in the C partition, which is the operating system partition. You need to make sure it is always having a free space Okay, at least 20% of the partition total size. Okay, so what we need to do, you can, or I prefer to use the first option, which is overwrite event as needed. This is the relevant or the more relevant option. Okay, you can do that, and it will only have one file, and when it reaches the maximum size, it will begin deleting old events in the log and then writing the new events instead of the old events. This is the most relevant one. And you can uh, make a schedule task before reaching the maximum size of the log. You can back it up to an external hard disk or to an external server or an external USB or whatsoever. So this is the most relevant one. But to make it archive the log when full, all of the logs will be archived in the C partition, which will fill uh, the the size or it will fill the C partition quickly. I do not prefer to do that. Okay, so make sure you use the first one, and you can have a script to 
uh, back up the file or the log before reaching the maximum size. Okay, so this is, I prefer to do that. Okay, and I have already script in the, uh, when, uh, when you see the Marvel Studio uh, playlist, I have already one video uh, discussing how we can back up the logs of the event viewer using a script. We will have a script and this will run through the schedule task it will back up the logs before it reaches the maximum size, okay? And you can specify the location where these uh, logs would be backed up. It can be uh, the D partition or another partition or external hard disk whatsoever. And then after backing it up, okay, on external hard disk or on the D partition, you can, for example, make your Veeam software or your backup software take a backup of these files. Okay, if you need, okay, you can put it on external hard disk so it will be backed up, or you can uh, put it uh, uh, on the D partition and take it or take this uh, backup files through the Veeam or your third party backup software. Uh, just wait for a moment, guys. So let's continue, guys. Here, this is what the report says or what the report check you need to check all of these logs if they are full and they are set to archive logs we have discussed why it is not a best practice to do that and this is the test we will see all of these tests i have already recorded how they will be done practically we will see how this will be done in a, a virtual environment but just i am checking with you guys what uh, this test means here is checking if you have an operating system more or uh, a newer version we all know that windows server 2012 now it is expired or it is not supported anymore so here i have failed this test, this test why because the windows server 2025 is a beta version or preview version he did, didn't succeed to uh, detect that it is a newer version than windows server 2012 so this is a fake or this is not a true uh, output because I have already uh, a newer version than uh, Windows Server 2012. Okay, so uh, here th the other test is the service test. We will stop at this one and we will see all, all of the other tests from the beginning how they will be uh, implemented practically. So let's see how this will be done. I think we have already discussed the WinRM. Uh, I think here I have already uh, shown you guys how this I have already asked uh, chat GPT okay as well yes I have done it so let's see practically how we will uh, apply these tests so here I open my virtual environment <laughs> I will do all of my tests on the primary domain controller. Here I need to increase the virtual memory. I will take one gigaram from the additional and give it to the primary because I don't have uh, uh, enough resources or enough RAM resources. So I just add or take from one virtual machine and add to the other. We can leave the, the other virtual machine closed because most of the tests will be done on the primary domain controller. So I will log in with my domain admin account. So we'll open the terminal. Run is run it as an administrator.
here you can run this test by running or this run this test individually by running this uh, custom PowerShell command. We need to change and put the domain controller value. DCSM0125. Now this is all of the data concerning the primary domain controller. Okay, this can be uh, used as an inventory or uh, software or like uh, a computer inventory or Active Directory computer inventory, especially for the domain controllers, not for all of the PCs in the domain or on servers. So this is the LDAP ports, the LDAP, uh, normal LDAP and the LDAP S. As we see, all of the data is appearing on the screen. I'm just comparing the displayed data on the screen with the uh, data reported. Okay, now WinRM, simply you can run this command. Okay, but actually it will not uh, it will not work. Okay, we need to find a PowerShell command to test the win win RM, and we will see how we can do that simply by running a special command. Okay, to get the win RM uh, to see if the win RM service is running and if it is configured or not. Copy so. and try to test the WinRM but actually it will fail because this is no, there's no such command so we will uh, go further and I will show you all uh, how we can do that simply if we need to here I ask it chat GBT for uh, how we can test the WinRM okay so it told me to do a couple of things first of all we need to uh, go to the control panel first of all okay we need to go to the control panel and open services and see if the WinRM if you go to Windows tools and we will see the services okay here you go and we can check if the WinRM Okay, or Windows Remote Management. Where is the Windows Remote Management? If we go further down, we can see that the Windows okay, Remote Management is running. Here we can see it is running. So here we can confirm that the test uh, is correct and the WinRM service is running. If we need to see the configuration of the WinRM, we can see a command or we can issue a command to see uh, the WinRM configuration. So if you go down, here I'm asking Claude to give me uh, something or to give me a partial command to test the WinRM. So he give me a command to uh, get uh, or to test. Here is the here is the command to test WinRM and to get the configuration of the WinRM. So and to start the service of WinRM, we have a lot of things. So first of all, we need to test the uh, WinRM locally, okay, on locally on a computer or remotely. We can test 
the WinRM service locally on the uh, domain controller and remotely on the other domain controller if we need. So test WinRM and localhost here. So we successfully have the WinRM running. So here is uh, the successful test. So now we can test it and now it is tested already. Now we can run the same test but remotely. Okay. Change the local host and put the remote machine. Okay, this is one thing. Now we can tell him to get the WinRM service to make sure the WinRM service is running. Okay. So press enter. Here we see it is running. So we have two tests to make sure that the WinRM is running. And the last one is to get. Uh, the configuration. If it's not run, we can tell him to start service WinRM. Now we can get the configuration of the WinRM. Okay. Now we can see there is a lot of things here. And here I was uh, 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 I was eager to know what this data means specifically. Uh, so I asked Claude to interpret this data or to explain this data. Let's see how this data is very, very useful. If we go and ask Claude to do that, let me uh, go to the test itself because I have already uh, have this uh, data already uh, saved. So let's tell him view all and see what was the data. I have already saved it. Where is the WinRM? I think I have it already. WinRM. So here is the testing the WinRM, and here is the let get me the data here. Okay, so here is the data. I asked him to uh, explain the WinRM configuration output. As we can see here, this is the data. It is explained, but I didn't actually. Uh, 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 understand all of it okay so first i tell him to explain it in technical terms and then to explain it in layman terms to make it more easy to understand so here is the data itself here is the interpretation or here is the explanation of this data here we are getting some data this data i don't know what it is exactly this is concerning the winrm so let's see uh, how claude uh, explained this data Start new chat. Certainly, I'll explain this WinRM configuration output in simpler terms. General config. Maximum message size is 500 kilobytes. Maximum timeout is 60 seconds. Can process up to 32,000 items in a batch. No practical limit on provider requests. Client settings. Waits 5 seconds for network delay. Uses Woosman as the URL prefix. Doesn't allow unencrypted connections. Supports various authentication methods, basic, digest, Kerberos, negotiate, certificate, but not cred SSP. Default ports, HTTP on 5985, HTTPS on 5986. No trusted hosts specified. Uses host as the SBN, service principal name, prefix. Service settings. Has specific security permissions set, the SDDL string. No practical limit on concurrent operations. Up to 1,500 concurrent operations per user. Enumeration timeout is 4 minutes. Allows up to 300 connections. Waits up to 120 seconds to retrieve packets. Doesn't allow unencrypted connections. Supports Kerberos and negotiate authentication, but not basic, certificate, or cred SSP. Uses the same default ports as the client. Accepts connections from any IPv4 or IPv6 address. Doesn't use compatibility listeners for HTTP or HTTPS. No specific certificate thumbprint set. Allows remote access. WinRS, Windows Remote Shell, settings. Allows remote shell access. Idle timeout is two hours. No practical limits on concurrent users, shell runtime, processes per shell, memory per shell, or shells per user. 
This configuration shows a fairly standard WinRM setup with security measures in place, like not allowing unencrypted connections and generous limits for operations and resources. It's set up to allow remote management while maintaining a good security posture. Copy. Retry. Kronir. Explain in layman's terms. Edit. Sure, I'll break it down in even simpler terms. Message limits. WinRM can send messages up to 500 kilobytes in size. It will wait up to one minute for a response before giving up. Security. It doesn't allow unsecured connections. Everything must be encrypted. It uses several ways to check if you're allowed to connect, like passwords or special tickets, Kerberos. By default, it uses port 5985 for normal connections and 5986 for extra secure ones. Remote access. It's set up to allow remote access, meaning you can manage this computer from another machine. It can handle quite a few people connecting at once, up to 300. Resource usage. There are very high limits on things like how many operations it can do at once or how much memory it can use. Basically, it's not likely to run out of resources. Remote shell. You're allowed to open a command prompt remotely. If you leave it idle, it'll stay open for two hours before closing. Overall, this setup is trying to balance being useful, allowing remote management, with being secure, requiring encryption, using strong authentication. It's designed to handle a lot of activity without bogging down. Think of it like a secure door to your computer. It's locked and requires proper identification to enter, but once you're in, you can do quite a bit of work without running into many restrictions. Copy. So we can see from the answer of the configuration WinRM, we have known a lot concerning the WinRM uh, security, the WinRM uh, uh, service itself, the setting of the service, uh, how much concurrent connection is allowed at the same time. So a lot of things we can know from the WinRM uh, configuration. So if I took this uh, uh, this message and ask ChatGPT to explain it in layman terms, let's see what will be the answer. So if you go there and ask it to explain this in layman terms and ask it to explain it one by one, okay, so we can see another answer. Okay, so let's see that and ask it like this. So you will see that And actually, I will take the same one and ask Perplexity to do the same. Okay, here we go. We tell him to ask. We tell him to explain the same setting. So let's go and see that. Okay, very, very good. Uh, very, very, very good, actually. So let's see uh, everything or the answer here by uh, ChatGPT first, and then to see the uh, answer of perplexity. If you go there and tell him to explain that or to read the answer. let's do that. Sure, let's break down this WinRM Windows Remote Management Configuration Output into simpler terms. This configuration output is divided into several sections, Config, Client, Service, and WinRs. Each section has various settings that control how WinRM behaves. 
Here's a layman's explanation. Config, max envelope size B, limits the size of messages in kilobytes that can be sent or received. Here, it's set to 500 k bytes. Max timeout MS specifies the maximum time in the ChatGPT can make mistakes. Check important info. ChatGPT quarto. Sure, let's break down this WinRM, Windows Remote Management, configuration output into simpler terms. This configuration output is divided into several sections, config, client, service, and winners. Each section has various settings that control how WinRM behaves. Here's a layman's explanation. Config. Max envelope size app limits the size of messages in kilobytes that can be sent or received. Here, it's set to 500 kilobytes. Max timeoutums specifies the maximum time in milliseconds that WinRM waits for a response before timing out. This is set to 60,000 milliseconds, 60 seconds. Max batch items, the maximum number of items that can be processed in a single batch, set to 32,000 items. Max provider requests, the maximum number of requests that can be handled simultaneously, set to a very high number, 4,294,967,295, which is essentially unlimited. Client, this section defines settings for the client side of WinRM. Network delays. The expected delay, in milliseconds, due to network latency, set to 5,000 milliseconds, 5 seconds. URL prefix, the URL prefix used for accessing the WinRM service. Here, it's set to Woosman. Allow unencrypted, determines if unencrypted communication is allowed. It's set to false, meaning only encrypted communication is permitted. Auth, authentication methods allowed. Basic, true allowed, digest, true allowed, Kerberos, true allowed, negotiate, true allowed, certificate, true allowed, cred SSP, false, not allowed, default ports, the default ports for HTTP and HTTPS communication, HTTP, 5985, HTTPS, 5986, Trusted hosts, lists of trusted hosts for client connections. It's empty, meaning no specific trusted hosts are configured. SBN underscore prefix, the service principal name prefix, set to host. Service. This section configures the server side of WinRM. Root SDDL, security descriptor definition language string that defines permissions for the WinRM service. It's a complex string controlling access and permissions. Max concurrent operations, the maximum number of operations that can run simultaneously, set to a very high number, 4,294,967,295, effectively unlimited. Max concurrent operations per user, the maximum number of operations a single user can run simultaneously, set to 1,500. Enumeration timeoutums, the timeout for enumeration operations, set to 240,000 milliseconds, 240 seconds. Max connections, the maximum number of concurrent connections allowed, set to 300. Max packet retrieval time seconds, maximum time in seconds to retrieve a packet, set to 120 seconds. Allow unencrypted, determines if unencrypted communication is allowed. It's set to false, meaning only encrypted communication is allowed. Auth. Authentication methods allowed. Basic, false, not allowed. Kerberos, true, allowed. Negotiate, true, allowed. Certificate, false, not allowed. Cred SSP, false, not allowed. CBT hardening level, set to relaxed, affecting channel binding token enforcement. Default ports, the default ports for HTTP and HTTPS communication. 
HTTP 5985 HTTPS 5986 IPv4 filter IP address is allowed for IPv4 Set to asterisk, meaning all IPv4 addresses are allowed IPv6 filter IP address is allowed for IPv6 Set to asterisk, meaning all IPv6 addresses are allowed Enable compatibility HTTP listener whether the compatibility HTTP listener is enabled. Set to false. Enable compatibility HTTPS listener. Whether the compatibility HTTPS listener is enabled. Set to false. Certificate thumbprint. The thumbprint of the certificate used for HTTPS. It's empty, indicating no specific certificate is configured. Allow remote access. Whether remote access is allowed. Set to true. Winners. This section configures Windows Remote Shell settings. Allow Remote Shell Access, whether Remote Shell Access is allowed. Set to True. Idle Timeout, the time, in milliseconds, before an idle remote shell session is closed. Set to 7,200,000 milliseconds, 2 hours. Max Concurrent Users, the maximum number of users that can have remote shell sessions concurrently. Set to 2,147,483,647, effectively unlimited. Max shell runtime. The maximum time, in milliseconds, that a remote shell session can run. Set to 2,147,483,647, effectively unlimited. Max processes per shell. The maximum number of processes that can run in a single remote shell session. Set to 2,147,483,647, effectively unlimited. Max memory per shell MB. The maximum memory, in megabytes, a single remote shell session can use. Set to 2,147,483,647 megabytes, effectively unlimited. Max shells per user. The maximum number of remote shell sessions a single user can have. Set to 2,147,483,647. Effectively unlimited. Summary. Config. Sets general limits for messages and operations. Client. Configures how the client, administrator, or remote tool interacts with WinRM, including security and authentication methods. Service. Configures the server, domain controller side, including security, performance, and access controls. Winners. Configures remote shell access settings, such as timeouts and resource limits. These settings ensure secure, efficient, and controlled remote management of the domain controller using WinRM. ChatGPT can make mistakes. Well, Check I think this uh, answer is very, very uh, technical. Okay, and some of them or some of these answers I can understand and some are not. I think the answer of Claude may be better than that. If we go to uh, perplexity and ask it to explain uh, the answer here, first of all, we need to go and close this one. If we go there and tell him to explain the same setting, let me... Uh, see that client side server side okay i think it is not that good all of it are very very technical and he didn't explain it in simple terms anyway uh, uh, if you tell him to explain in layman terms i think we don't need to explain it anymore so this is how we can uh, use the AI to explain the different uh, output for different commands. So if you go further and you can see all of this, we have already discussed it before. So let's go and see the other one. Here, uh, this is for the event log. We have discussed this, okay, and we have uh, I have showed you all how we can do that, how we can uh, uh, we can do this or how we can 
uh, make it or change it to uh, so let me give you something here we have seen how we can change this to auto backup by the way uh, we have this it is called circular so he will refer to it in the text or in the test as circular and this is auto backup okay and the other one i don't know actually what it is but uh, these two are the most important circular this is not what we need we need it to auto backup which means archive the log when full so we need to make sure we have this already done i have shown you all how we can do that from uh, the uh, from the event viewer itself very very simple and we can use the command here uh, in the uh, if we go there and use this command it will give us if we have auto backup or not we will see the result we need to check the log mode check the log mode it we need to see it is already if we see this is the output of or if we take this this is the output displayed here let me show you all how we can or where to get here is the auto backup you need to focus on the log mode so when you put this command it will give you the output for each of these logs you need to check and see if the auto backup log mode is auto backup okay so what you need to do you need to go and cho choose this option if you are intending to do that i prefer not to do that we need to ch uh, choose the other one which is overwrite events and then if you use the other one you need to check and see if uh, the log mode is changed to O2 backup okay so this is one thing okay we need to make sure it is there and we have seen this before uh, this is if you need to tell him uh, to use a script to uh, backup the event viewer logs you can do that and I have seen or I've shown you all a script to do that uh, I can show you where is the script uh, you can check the Marvel Studio uh, log or, or the Marvel Studio uh, 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 playlist okay and see the backup uh, video okay so let me uh, show you something here okay okay I think this is uh, I asked the AI to give me a script to check the operating system so here I have passed this one and come to the operating system here because uh, here I ask it to generate uh, uh, generate a script to check the operating system if it is larger than 2012 okay or, or more than 2012 this command didn't help me to get any data so I asked the AI to create a script to check if I have my operating system more than uh, uh, 2012 let's go and show you all the script itself so let's go further back here i have uh, changed the script okay let me show i think i have got it from claude okay let's go there and see i think i've asked claude to give me this script and now we can put the domain controller name and then run the script i think let me show you the script okay so here this is uh, this is the cloud and i think if i go and get you guys the script if you go to view all and let me show you the script okay Okay, I think I have it here. Uh, okay, I think here. Just win on M. No, I think here there is a script to. So basically, you can tell him to generate a script to uh, check if you have the operating system. This is the script. Okay, I will leave it, or you can. Uh, gig, gig, uh, see it from the screen
So here it's giving us that I have is not greater than 2012. So I will stop at minute 54.19. Hope this video is informative for you all and thank you all for viewing. Thank you so much.